This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a very old friend of mine come in called Robbie Dueck and he is into eSports, uh, which is online gaming and stuff. And he's the CEO of Blast Pro Series, which is an awesome media company, events company that organize uh, live events where you can go and watch teams play computer games. So super cool. It is a massively growing industry and entertainment kind of segment. So you're gonna, you could choose to watch Netflix, Premier League football or Blast Pro Series. So it's really interesting and we hear about how that industry has developed, um, the money the inv- that's involved, how it's becoming more professional and the age range of people that are taking part and stuff. So really interesting and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Boom, we're live. Fantastic. Thanks for coming in, Robbie. So what, what is e-gaming exactly? Electronic gaming, so e-sports and e-gaming, um, the ability for a generation of young gamers to be able to go out there and play competitively, right? Around the world, in, in arenas, or you know online against each other. Simply put, it's electronic gaming played by millions and millions of kids and people around the world. Crazy. You played when you were younger. I have never been an incredibly big gamer, um, you know, Back when we grew up, I was on the Game Boy, Super NES, uh, FIFA, FIFA and Fever. stuff like that. And then much more moved to sort of the spectator angle of watching sports and entertainment. That's what I think this is now. It's sports and entertainment and you're a viewer of essentially a sports and entertainment spectacle yeah, yeah. at any moment in time. So you can kind of like either watch Netflix, watch the news, watch football, watch esports, UFC. Yeah, that's it. Like you've got I mean, so much. You come in and, and I think the generations for today that are interested in gaming, they, they're essentially have two choices either they are actually gaming themselves or they watch gaming uh, in the same way that you know when we were younger we'd go around and kick a football or we'd go to a match right it's exactly the same thing for the younger generations today they just basically go home and either they'll play a game or they'll they'll go and watch something on twitch or one of the streaming platforms that that's out there today and and digest content what, what's twitch for those who don't know so twitch is a live streaming platform that's owned uh, owned and operated by amazon global platform producing you know oodles and oodles of content on a daily basis and they're you know very very strong in esports so what so people are playing games and i can just log in and watch you play a game essentially yeah crazy uh so yeah you're watching essentially live tournaments live gaming people playing games at any point in time wow you could do that on youtube as well the live element is slightly less specific to to youtube you're probably watching more vod based stuff but but essentially twitch would be the destination although now mixers in the game so that's owned by microsoft all right there's been some big news recently that that ninja who's very well known influencer in the world of uh, of esports and gaming has moved from twitch to mixer Oh wow! And that's caused a big stir in the ecosystem. Why is he moved, or she? We, we we don't we don't know the ins and outs of the deal. We presume that that Mixer have made it very interesting for Ninja to be there. And then this week's news, which you might have picked up on, is there's another one that's moved in that direction called Shroud. So we'll see what happens. And so and so they're both like top gamers. Top gamers, yeah. And so they get millions of views. Yeah, millions of views. Millions of you know concurrent viewers watching their content when they stream. So they go live, and then you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are watching them stream at any point in time. So Amazing. if you think about it in sort of really pure form, it's a bit like you know back in the day we'd switch the TV on and watch a live show, right? You're now no longer doing that necessarily. You're just watching a live stream of someone else streaming content. Yeah, a bit like if someone was sitting here today in the room with us watching us two old farts <laughs> sit around and have a, and have a chat. Yeah. yeah. Exactly yeah. the same scenario. And how how long are they playing for per day? Some of them can stream for hours. So f- from our perspective, as a, as a tournament organizer and a producer yeah. and an operator of IP, you know, we'll we'll be live in the year for hundreds of hours a year, and we'll have audiences watching our content, and they'll watch it on non-linear platforms, so the likes of Twitch and, and other other platforms like that. But they'll also watch them on linear platforms. This is what's really interesting, interesting. about the space, and this is where it sort of bridges between sports and entertainment. 
So you'll find that the broadcasters of this world, so if you take someone like ProSieben in Germany, or big channels like even the BBC in the UK, or Sky Sports, they're licensing this content from producers, and they're putting it on their channels Interesting. for people to watch. Oh, wow. So very exciting. Interesting. So like 8 till 9, you can watch Pro Blast series in Copenhagen. Yeah, so you would stream, you know, you'd basically tune in and you'd be able to watch, you know, an esports tournament, whether that's Counter Strike or League of Legends or Dota, and you'd watch it on your TV. Nice. Uh, or you'd be watching it on the TV provider's, you know, OTT platform. Yeah. Right? And that's the way the world works nowadays, which has completely changed in the last sort of five Massive, years. Massively changed. And what's yours, the Pro Blast series? Yeah, so Blast Pro series is. Blast Pro series. Don't worry, yeah, that's fine. Blast Pro series is a global Counter-Strike tournament. So Counter-Strike is an eSport, and it's a global tournament series that we take around the world. And this year we've been in, um, we started the year in Sao Paulo with a proper sort of nice. big party in Sao Paulo, packed venue. Uh, How many sold, people come? 8,000 people in that venue. We sold wow. out within six hours. Crazy. Um, and the game was Counter-Strike. Counter yeah, Counter-Strike, which is a game, funnily enough, has been around for 20 years. Really? Yeah. Um, so Fortnite, much younger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Counter Strike has been around for a long time, and there's a big player base, and there's a big fan base. Right. Okay. And then you have professional teams playing Counter Strike. So in the same way, you know that we'd watch the Premier League and watch, you know, Liverpool, Tottenham, Arsenal, whoever. Uh, you'll find teams are watching, you know, the American teams, the Brazilian teams, the Danish teams, the French teams. And these are all professional players wow. playing. Are these national teams or people from the country put together their own team? It's a mix. Compete. Some of them are, you know, there's a Finnish team with just Finnish players. Right. But actually, mo more often than not now, you're finding a mix of players. And then they're, they're switching from playing together in their native language to playing in English. All right. And what's interesting Why about... Why are they switching? Well, because if there were five Finnish players, they'd be playing in Finnish. Fine. Right? Yeah, if yeah. then Britain and Sweden or whatever yeah, yeah. else. Uh, but what's interesting about that is that um, you're seeing a, a massive change in, in the ecosystem and you're seeing that these players are becoming far more professional uh, and, and, you know, they're you know, working a lot harder on their physical fitness and they're working <laughs> harder on their mental coaching. Yeah, so, so these teams have all got, so some of these teams are, are you know, multi-million euro enterprises, right? Multi-million euro? Oh, for sure, yeah. Wow, well, so, go, let's go into finances in a bit. Yeah, for sure, that's yeah, yeah. a really interesting topic. But the teams, in order to succeed at the pinnacle of their career, right? So players are between, say, 18, and it's difficult to say when a player is, is kind of peaked out. We don't, we don't really know that. Can you peak that. out on that? I mean, one of the, there was a player that just announced his retirement who I think is about 30 odd. All right. Then they'll go into a bit like how, you know, Lineker announced his retirement and then went yeah. into broadcaster. And, and so they'll go into what we call casting and producing and being, you know, a face for the game, which is fantastic. Yeah. And some of them are really good at that. But they'll, in, inside of their clubs, because they're owned by clubs. And by the way, many of these uh, teams are owned by traditional sports organizations. Really? So you'll find like, you know, the 76ers own a club and you wow. know, Houston Rockets own a club and FC Copenhagen owns a club and Paris Saint-Germain in the game like there's there's you know it's, it's incredible what's going on so they wow. put this infrastructure behind them they give them sports coaches physical fitness they look at mental fitness they train them super hard and this notion of a you know an esports player being someone who you know doesn't eat healthy and goes to bed Have at three in the morning a fizzy drink sitting there yeah gone really gotta go and that yeah. i think is this misnomer where parents think that potentially kids are not using their time intelligently yeah. uh, because actually if you take lots of these games they're very tactical they're very strategic there's a lot of brain power that's being used there's a lot of skill um, and I think that's misunderstood I think it's massively misunderstood there's a big dialogue about don't let kids watch TV don't let kids play too many games you know get them reading books all of these things but I think when we grew up it was you know you don't really want to stay in the house and play games or the ones that did, they weren't regarded as like the high achievers, let's say. Whereas now you can have a genuine career in e-gaming, right? Yeah. I mean, if your parents allow you to go down that path. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's, I think that in, in the UK, um, you know, there's something called the British Esports Association, for example. And so we were talking in the middle of last week and, you know, I think, I think there's more work that needs to be done at a sort of grassroots level. And there is a lot of work happening in schools to give kids a, a framework and a structure to be able to compete 
in 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 sort of structured manner right and that in scandinavia it's sort of part and parcel of daily life right, right. so okay. i say i talk a lot about scandinavia because our business is based in in copenhagen and in london okay and yeah. so we spend a lot of time in and but there is just an incredible player base in scandinavia and it's part of their culture interesting so you you switch on the tv and you'll watch handball and you'll watch you know esports and that's just normal. Um, whereas here in the UK, it's, just, it's not often. No, 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 no. But but going back to the original point, you know, the, the kids today, yeah, we need to, you know, we need to provide them those boundaries and that that sort of structure around them to be able to to work in the way that they need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I think it might be a long way. Could be a long way. I mean, even my my kids, like my my oldest one, starting to play. Um, a little games on the phone and stuff like that but I would say m- most of the people in her school there's even a thing about do you want to let them watch TV how much TV can you detox them from TV <laughs> and then you're t- like they're playing games so I think we've got a bit of a way to go here yeah I mean listen it, it's it's a constant battle it's a constant challenge um, you know we live in, in you know everyone knows we live in a world where social media you know is, is hugely important and technology is crucial to everything we do um, so I think we have to embrace it yeah. and I think when we embrace it we have to put the boundaries we have to put the structure around these so you know so if you're you know if you've got a 12 year old just say alright well you're going to come home you can do your homework and then you can game for an hour and then you have dinner with your family and then you know and if you want to game professionally then you put some structure in and around that individual where he goes to you know an area where he can game with others and he's yeah, given yeah, yeah. the right tools to make that happen we don't want kids sitting in bedrooms doing stuff at you know three o'clock in the morning yeah online etc yeah going back to how um your series works yeah so you started in sao, sao paulo. paulo yeah and then we went to miami Cool. Then we went from Miami to Madrid. Then we ended back. We went back to the US to LA. Uh, then we had summer off for two months. Is it months most ago. popular in in the US? Or it's, yeah, one of the most popular stations for this particular sport is in the US. Right. Okay. Russia's big. Germany's big. France, Turkey. Right. And we went from LA to Moscow, which was mental. Love to go there. Uh, Moscow is fantastic. Um, and then this weekend we we're in Copenhagen. Amazing. Uh, and that's kind of our home. Home Same tournament, turf. yeah, uh, and it's twelve and a half thousand people in the arena. Wow, we're fully sold out, and they're just going to be buzzing. And always, always the same game. This is Counter Strike, yeah. yeah, always the same. At the moment, we're in Counter Strike. We could move into other esports as well. We're thinking Fine. about that, and we've just launched our a rework format for twenty twenty. So we're moving away from Blast Pro Series, and we're calling it Blast Premier. Okay, um, and it's uh, it's a, a sort of more structured. Uh, tournament series throughout the year. So kind of league, league. So how does it actually work then? Yeah. So this one we had. It was a bit like Formula One. So you had sort of seven stops, okay. six stops, yeah, yeah. and then we finished the year. By the way, in the Middle East in okay. December, um, and the winning teams, uh, the top four teams, would compete in the Middle East. That was the structure for this year. Uh, next year we have a much more sort of structured, uh, organised process where we've got you know twelve teams that are competing at the start, and then some more teams that come in. Uh, you know, sort of from qualification through local leagues and local, you know, local play-ins. And then there's a spring final and a, and a, and a fall final, so an autumn final. And then there's a global, global final at the end of the year wow. with a, a prize tag on that one of a million and a half dollars. Wow. With the winning team taking a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. So. It's no joke anymore. No, I think, <laughs> you know, these, these players are earning a lot of cash. Crazy. So how so how do you get in then? So you alluded to it a little bit. So there's local there's local um, let's say series or competitions, um, which are affiliated to you guys. Or yeah, no. Uh, so so in so you know grassroots level, there's a lot of there's a lot of activity in and around players going and bringing them bringing their gaming laptop and playing against each other at hacks or you know these yeah, things yeah. where they they're hackathons or whatever. And then off the back of that, you know there's depending on the country you live in there are multiple ways to sort of get recognized but most of these players will start playing online against each other and suddenly they'll have results that will sort of start moving in the right direction and then they'll be you know they'll be thought of okay hold on there's a guy to watch there or a girl to watch there yeah. and um and suddenly they'll get discovered and they sort of make their way up okay and then so the team will say like come and try out come and come on come board, on, come on board um, yeah and then they get paid a salary and so is that at that point if, if a professional team recognizes you at that point you can start monetizing some of those younger players will earn prize money at some of the more grassroots level tournaments 
but nothing in the scheme of what you're talking about at a, at a, at a larger level. Now, yeah. that said, uh, some of the players that entered into the Fortnite World Cup or World Championship or whatever it was called, you know, they, they'd come through a mass of qualifying. Right. And so that really was sort of a rags to riches story. Because they have to fund themselves. And totally. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the kid that won, um, and I think he took home $3 million or something, right? $3 million. He, he, you know, he doesn't have an agent. He he hasn't got an infrastructure around How him. How old is he? I think he's 16. 16. Crazy. You know, he hasn't got, you know, hasn't got all those things that a football club or an esports club puts around you. Yeah, yeah. And yet he's suddenly winning, you know, all that money. Uh, some of these guys, though, of course, have got agents. They've got, you know, players unions. And but I guess at 16, you're not doing it to make 3 million. You just really love gaming. You love gaming. I guess you just... You love gaming. It's your passion. It's it's everything that you think about. And and these guys are generally very good. I mean, if you the series that we produced with some of the players in and around sort of hand and eye coordination, and there was this piece of there was an an ex army official that was training some of these guys and working on this the psychology of things. And he was like, guys could be you know airline pilots. They could be fighter pilots. Uh, they are that good and they are that yeah. quick because the the sort of hand to eye coordination has to be at that level. Um, that it's incredibly impressive. So, Amazing. And then you you start to lose it then at thirty ish or something. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, I th- I'd assume that you're. I'd like yeah. to feel I'm, I can still do it now. The, I think you could. I think you could do it with all that training. Thirty eight, like you more than half their age, more than double their age. <laughs> I, I say it's never too late. But then when I pick up a mouse and, and a keyboard in the office and try and play, they all laugh at me. I'm like one of the worst. I literally, <laughs> I'm like literally terrible. And some of the some of the more younger members of staff, they're like incredible at this okay. game. The sixteen, I mean, like he wouldn't have been playing for very long. No, no, but I just think he, you know, the, some of these kids have just—they just take to it, and it's yeah, yeah. But you know, even yeah. if you, I, I sometimes do this, I sound like an old fart, but I watch like younger kids on the tube playing with their mobile phones, and the way that they hold it and the way that they actually use it is completely different to you or I. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. even like you know our parents who are sort of texting with one finger, <laughs> fat fingers, pressing every button, and so fast. So, but I think that actually says a lot about. The but these way. are natives, right? I mean, yeah. digital natives. They're, they're like, born, they're born like this. Yeah, mm. my kids are like iPads and profession stuff. on that already. Phones. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, like all over it, all over it. It's crazy. So you're really seeing this now become a career of choice. For some of the, so the professionals, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they 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 aspire to be athletes. They are athletes. I mean, last year in the Copenhagen Arena in our tournament, the Danish Prime Minister opened the show. Really? And he came onto our stage, which is this triangle stage with six teams housed underneath it. Okay, so if you sort of think about a house, yeah, um, and there's six teams sitting underneath it, and they're all playing at the same time. Anyway. Danish Prime Minister, who don't ask me to pronounce his name because I won't do a very good job of it, he comes on the stage and he gives a speech which is broadcasted around the world because we broadcast to millions, right? So when we go live, non-linear and linear broadcast. Right. And he says, you guys are truly athletes. And that statement then gets played out again and again and again. And and I think it really is true because I think that if you're going to be at the pinnacle of your of your sporting career, you've got to train, you've got to work hard. Uh, no one gets anywhere without working hard, right? For sure. Yeah. And so these guys think of themselves in, very much in that frame of mind. And um, they're encouraged to think healthy and work fit and work hard. Yeah, yeah. And I reckon, yeah, they all, they've all aspired to be that. And funnily enough, to, to the extent that, you know, you try and get them, some of these players to do sort of media sessions or a podcast like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't want to know. They just <laughs> want a game. Yeah, they yeah, just no, want yeah. It's crazy. And it's just amazing how much of a spectator sport it's become. Because gaming's always been around. But watching people game, mm. certainly for like our age group, it takes a bit of time to get your head around. When I joined and I came to my sort of first tournament, I was like, really? Are we going to sit in this arena for... 10 hours. 10 hours. 10 hours? 10 hours. Wow. So for, so for example, on Saturday, doors will open at 11, right? The first match will start at sort of 1, 2, whenever it is, right? But but they'll be there at night. What, queuing up? Queuing. And, but they've already and got, they got seats. And they've got tickets They've got seats and they've got tickets. They'll all run in and they'll be there. And then they'll they'll be there for 10 hours because the, mat, the, the tournament will finish at, say, 10 in the evening or whatever that is. And they'll run to the toilet so they don't miss anything. Really? And then when you produce... And there's one game on at a time, right? So actually, we do three. Three at a time? Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting format. Uh, so we have three simultaneous matches going on and three simultaneous broadcasts broadcast across the world. So it means that 
you know, the Germans can watch the German teams, the French can watch the French, and, you know, right. whoever wants to watch the yeah, other yeah. one, right? um, which also adds a heap of complexity and cost to our production. I bet, yeah. But it makes for an incredible spectacle. But you're watching a spectator sport, and these guys are engaged, they're shouting, they're cheering, and, you know, then there's there's a whole element of sort of food and beverage going on in the same way that yeah, yeah. you would have at the NFL. Right? Alcohol? There is in certain arenas around the yeah, world. Yeah. There are various laws around age groups in terms of what you can allow into arena depending on the country of question. Yeah, yeah. So Germany has some quite stringent laws around that, whereas other markets don't. Yeah. And they're there for hours watching, consuming, crazy. going crazy, tweeting, desperate to get player signatures, desperate to get as close to the action as possible, to be able to see their hero. <laughs> Man. Crazy. What's the age range? Depending on the country, you'll see between you know fourteen year olds to forty five year olds, and they go with their parents, presumably. Yeah. Some yeah. of them go with their parents. Some of them have to be accompanied in the given country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's regulations yeah. around that. Yeah. But if, for example, this weekend in Denmark, it would not surprise me to see push chairs really with babies in that arena because parents will come with their kids who are you know ten and they may have a couple other kids and then there'll be suddenly there'll be a little baby there and like last year I was wow, like, it's crazy, it's mad. And they'll all be there and everyone's watching together. And it's a family day out. So it's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. And they're buying merch, you know, so they're buying yeah. team jerseys, they're buying stuff associated with the sport. And so when you're when you're producing shows like this for twelve hours, you're having to keep people entertained, right? Yeah. Um, and so you're having to do stuff on your on your broadcast and in your in your show that makes sure that they're excited. So we've got things like kiss cams and hug cams and you know, all these giveaways and, and just just a bunch of activations that are happening in the arena. Yeah, yeah. Mostly by the sponsors that have come in and sponsored. Yeah. So this is, I mean, if you think about it, like, and who's sponsoring, like main main consumer brands, and yeah, yeah. So more and more, I yeah. say, you 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 know, the original sponsors in and around esports were sort of endemic tech brands, right, you know, hardware yeah. developers that want to sell their their wear. Now you're finding that um, you know many of those brands are you know real mainstream brands. You know, you're yeah, talking yeah. about FMCG brands, auto, you know, luxuries coming into the space now. <laughs> Uh, we've had, you know, we, we've had, you know, trainers and we've had fast food outlets and we've had, we've had everything, you know, it's, and yeah, it's, yeah. you know, even finance and transportation and they're all into it. Crazy. Because those audiences for them are really hard to reach. Yeah. yeah. And eSports gives them that opportunity. Amazing. How, how did it, how did your, your start? Fast Pass series. So we started in Copenhagen, yeah, uh, and back in a 2017. Okay, so not too long ago. Not too long ago, and then we've really scaled in the last 12 months. Yeah, and so yeah, private so equity backed, and yeah, backed by VCs. But yeah, um, cool. and uh, you know, very supportive. Um, you know, prominent uh, Scandinavian and uh, investors actually. Quite yeah, well. very supportive, and I've got a really amazing team around me of individuals that come from the media and the entertainment business, sports business. Uh, producing live events. I've got guys from Live Nation, from the Olympics, from Formula E, from football clubs, and they just, everyone brings something to this game. And then I've got a lot of core esports, you know, uh, employees. Hardcore. uh, Hardcore. Yeah, yeah. One of our younger ones, and I say, well, what, what's the deal with this? What, what, what does that actually mean? And he'll translate it into sort of Robbie language so I can nice. get it. <laughs> nice. How did you get involved? So I was actually brought in because I knew someone who was working in, in the business. Right. Uh, who'd, who'd been involved since the inception. Um, so that I'd worked with that person at Disney. And uh, and I thought, well, this is a really big opportunity. And, you know, I'd, I'd been in, in the world of influencers before that and mobile advertising. And, and I think that esports is going to be huge. I think it is already huge. I and mean, if you look at the statistics, Statistics. Consumption is, you know, through the roof. Monetization is not quite there yet, uh, but there's every chance that this is this is the this is the next big thing. Yeah, yeah. So for yeah. me, it was like, all right, I'm going to go back and do a startup again and nice and build it. So when did you start with them? About a year and a half ago, as you expected. I'm working ridiculously hard, much really? harder than I've ever probably worked <laughs> right. in my life. But it's incredibly exciting. Like no one day is the same. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it gives you that variety that you wouldn't have. You know, I never know what the next day is going to be. I meet so many interesting people. Yeah, but. And, you know, we'll, I'll go from here to another meeting where someone's going to talk about us doing a collaboration with their product and their format and their series. And, and that's actually nothing to do with esports. It's something much more associated with health and fitness. Right. So you'd love that. Right. Love that. And then I'll go from there to another meeting. And it was just it varied. Someone came in the other week was talking about you know, us doing something in the music industry. You just got to choose your opportunities, though, because, you know, like you can get you can get completely distracted. By so I guess you, you guys produce these great events and it happens to be e-gaming. Is that how you, you kind of think? Yeah, of we, we think of ourselves as a media business, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we have 
these viewers we think of others as with viewers and users so viewers watching our content whether that's in an arena or online yeah um, and users essentially purchasing merchandise purchasing ticketing buying content in some capacity whether that's you know in arena or online and that's how we kind of frame our business and we think about our business in that way and nice experiences whether that's and it's all in and around esports so what you do in the future so is it growing the events live events bigger more online what's the yeah i mean um you know so live events cost a lot to produce uh so i think we'll we'll we've increased our output year on year so we did we had about 120 hours of live this year we'll be at 300 next year 300 hours hours of of live live broadcast of events wow and at 10 hours an event? Uh, yeah, it, actually the format slightly changes, right, okay. but yeah, yeah, we'll have a strategy where we're always on. So we're always producing content. So so if you've got your own studio team, yeah. content team. And then and I can go, we'll go to a website and I can always watch stuff on your website? That, that's the, at the moment, there's not enough content on that website. So most of our content lives on social, right? So okay. on third party platforms. Yeah. We want to make sure that you come to our destination and you're entertained, right? You know, one of the things we stand by is excite and entertain. And, and I think that we need to do more of that. When you're tuning in and watching a live broadcast, we want you to feel totally engrossed in it. And actually, we want you to be able to interact with it even more, right? So we're constantly trying to sort of push the boundaries and make things different. Yeah. There's a, more of that, a lot more of that to come in the next sort of 24 months. It's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've watched, I watch a lot of UFC. Right. And I mention it because it seems like you guys aren't too dissimilar to where they were like back in the day. They're a really unknown sport that's... I mean, now I think done amazingly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. And ESP, on ESPN, it'd be quite cool if we turn into tune into Sky Sports at one point, and then they're commenting on your teams. And I think it would be amazing. And I think there's that. That's by the way, I don't think that's too far away. And the UFC is is a great example to aspire towards. You know, when we yeah. look at our business, we look at what UFC have done. You know, who would have thought sort of ten years ago that you'd be tuning in and watching people essentially fighting, right? Yeah, yeah. But boxing's always been the main thing. Yeah. And then UFC, it seems. I mean, it's got so popular now. Huge. And and they've done such an amazing job. But they've done an amazing job at creating a media business. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that yeah. that I think is the difference. You know, you you'll find that they've got people who are subscribing to their content all the time because it's just and and then there's this sort of fandom in around the players and so I, I think all well, the fighters rather. So I yeah, think yeah. I think it's I think they've done a great job and we we look a lot what they do. What's that? I mean, we look a lot about around Formula E. I mean, yeah. You know, Formula E when it first came out, people were like, well, what is all this? about right you know electric cars bang on the money it's like yeah. so what it needs to be at the right time they've got this incredible circuit in the most incredible destinations in the world and that's very exciting so what so when we look at what we produce we, we do really want to be in premium destinations and yeah, we want to be yeah. like front and center we want to be talk of the town now that's hard if you're in miami yeah, yeah. there's a lot of blooming noise in miami yeah, or la yeah. right there's a lot for someone to do on a weekend in la but um, I can guarantee you this weekend in Copenhagen, like not one person won't know that this is happening in the Royal Arena and every, <laughs> everything will be around it. Amazing. Yeah, very exciting. How can we find out what's coming up in the calendar for next year? Yeah, so uh, blastpremier.com okay. is one place to start. And then uh, the, this season is finishing on blastproseries.com. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, those are the places to go on Instagram and on Twitter and everywhere else. You can cool. And are you going to do one in London? We might have some of our season next season Ooh. in London. Spoiler alert. Let there. me know, let me know. Well, you'll be the first to get an invite, Lewis. O2 Centre, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Filling that O2, let's have a think about it. Yeah, that'd be challenging, but, um, but you never know. A couple know, of in years, a couple in of years, future, you'll be there. In the future. Cool, yeah. thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate your time, really and loved it. And look forward to coming watching an event. Thanks, man. Cool. Cheers. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.